Hey, hey, everybody. Welcome in, welcome in, welcome in <clears throat> to the Real Estate Investor live stream. I'm Clayton Morris. Hope you're doing well on this Tuesday, this Taco Tuesday. Coming up today, we're going to be talking about rising interest rates, what that means for investors, um, including what you should do right now, what to consider moving forward with your investment strategy. So we're going to look at these rising interest rates for 2022. That is coming up here in just a few moments. But first, I'd like to welcome you. Let the YouTube algorithm send out its alerts, which usually takes a few minutes. So we'll just kind of chill out, listen to some music for a few moments as we welcome everybody in. Let me know where you're joining us from today, what part of the world you're in. saw that on the East Coast. I know it's springtime, but I know that it, <clears throat> on the East Coast, it's like down into the teens again. Hope everyone is doing well on this Taco Tuesday. You guys having tacos tonight? We got the beans cooking already. We've got the rice ready to go. We've got the shells ready to go. Faisal, am I saying that right, Faisal, <clears throat> in New Jersey? Veronica says, hello, champion. Thank you for calling me champion. Where can I get a personal loan, 50K, placing a mortgage on my fully paid property? Where can you get a personal loan? A personal loan, placing a mortgage on my fully paid off property. Uh, why would you want a personal loan on your property? I would just go, I mean, if you've got to just use a traditional lender, not a personal loan. I would just get a, um, work with a local bank. Daniel wants to know, do they have Portuguese tacos? No. No, they do not. No, that's one thing that's sorely lacking in Portugal is the, uh, the tacos. <clears throat> I'm telling you. If someone started like a really good taco truck there, <clears throat> would do fantastic. Oh, not with my bank. My credit is crap due to a divorce. I see. Uh, huh. I would try, I don't know about a personal loan. I think, again, I would look at I would look at a private loan based on the asset. So like, um, depends on where you are, but like JC, JC, J-A-S-E-Y, JC Capital Investors, um, Kyle JC is a friend of mine. He runs that. They do, they do loans on properties and they don't really, I, if, from what I understand, they don't really care much about your personal, uh, you know, credit score. So I would check them out. Um, Direct Lending Partners, DLP, Direct Lending Partners. Um, they also do private stuff as well. So check them out. Veronica. Well, yeah, I mean, again, who cares about your personal credit? I mean, again, you should be able to find some of these just got to shop around. I mean, either these traditional lenders um, or some of these private lenders like Direct Lending Partners, JC Capital. Um, just, you know, frankly, just go on LinkedIn and do a search for private lenders, you know, and you'll find people that actually have that as their title, private lenders, and you'll find a list of private lenders on LinkedIn. Um, so I would check that out. Plus, also, if you're in, if you're in Jacksonville, <clears throat> I don't know if you're physically there or not, but just go to meetup.com. Um, just go to meetup.com and look for RIA, local RIA meetings, R-E-I-A meetings, real estate investment meetups um, in your area and go to one of those meetings and you're gonna see 50 or 100 people in that room. There's gonna be lenders in there, private lenders, and just raise your hand. Don't be shy, walk around and talk to those people in those rooms and say, hey, here's my situation, my credit is shit. Um, but I've got these properties. I have this, my credit is crap because of a divorce, um, but I've got these properties. Um, they're all paid off and I'd like to get some loans on them. So try that. You can even do that virtually too. 
like just go to meetup.com and look for real estate meetups in that area in in um in jacksonville um and then just email people that are members of the, those meetups you don't even have to physically go to the meetups r-e-i-a <clears throat> real estate investment associations right r-e-i ria meetings so there, every town is going to have RIA meetings. RIA meetings are just, it's a group of investors that get together and hang out. It's like, you know, it's like book clubs. I mean, it's not a professional organization. Um, but if you go to meetup.com and do a search for REIA in Jacksonville, you're going to probably find one or two. And you look at their members list and see if any of them in that members list are, you know, go through their bio, bio biographies and find out if any of them are lenders or private lenders or bankers or whatever, and then reach out to them. Hope that helps. Veronica, Veronica Vaughn. Sorry. We were watching, um, we we're watching, we've been watching a lot of Adam Sandler in the house lately for some reason. I'm sure you've had a lot of Veronica jokes over the years. They had Veronica Vaughn. <clears throat> So we are talking about interest rates on the show today. We're going to wait here just another moment or so. Get your coffee. Get your coffee. I've got my I got my two shots of espresso over some delicious oat milk. Yes, that is a Mandalorian mug. <clears throat> Faisal, any thoughts on what to do with an old 401k housing? Oh, uh, that's housing about 230000 for my previous job. I think your team has some options, but I cannot recall the specifics. Yes, <laughs> Faisal, that's like right in our wheelhouse. Just, uh, have you already booked a call with our team? But that would be my first stop on the Faisal Express is book a call with our team. So just go to morrisinvest.com and jump on the phone with our team and we can help you figure that out because that's what our specialty is. So go ahead and do that. But whether it's you know moving it over, okay. Um, okay, well, hopefully uh, maybe something is in motion there. I'm not sure I needed to re I need to reconnect with your team. Okay, yeah, reconnect with, I'm not sure who on your team you're, you're working with. Um, but please do so and we can help you with that because whether it's you know probably moving into a self-directed IRA, I would imagine, um, and we can help you get that set up in like 10 minutes um, and positioning that those funds into cash flow. So taking that and turning it into cash flow, that's the goal, right? Hey, Bill Perdue, welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome, welcome, everyone. So my headset broke. I'm really not happy about it. So now I've got this new headset or this temporary headset that's like sticking out of my ear. <clears throat> in the TV business, um, where I'd have like a producer talking to me in my ear while I'm trying to talk, um, called an IFB. Normally you can't see it because it's all the way in my ear, but I've got these that are like sticking out. So if you wonder what that is, it's not a hearing aid. It's my, uh, it's my IFB. Is three hundred dollars cash flow enough for a rental? What do you guys think? Well, um, is it Jesus? Um, I mean, it all really depends. Right. I mean, what are the what is the context of that question, Jesus? Like, and I don't mean to be calling you out about it, but like, think about that for a second. Like, what is the context of that question? There's a lot I need to ask you there, right? Like, could anyone else here in the chat maybe help out, Jesus? Like, you guys know, understand the process here, right? Let's all think together collectively, creatively, right? So, what questions should we be asking? Is it? Am I saying it right? Is it Jesus or is it Jesus? Um, I never know. I don't want to make assumptions. 
right? When I go to a Starbucks, people think, even though my name is Clayton, people think it's, people hear whatever they want. They hear Clinton, Clint, whatever. Um, anyway, what do you guys think? It's both Jesus and Jesus. Okay. Okay, so Faisal wants to know, he, he, Faisal's asking a question, is that $300 pre or post expenses, management fees, etc.? Great question. Exactly. Right? Jesus, uh, Jesus says, my wife calls me Jesus. <laughs> Jesus. Okay. Am I saying that? Or G Jesus, yeah. What was Bill, Bill Cosby's famous joke before Bill Cosby, you know? Uh, Bill Cosby said that when he was growing up, he thought his name was Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, get over there and clean this stuff up. Daniel wants to know, what's your basis to calculate ROI? Right, exactly. So what is your what is your basis to calculate the return on that investment? Daniel, are you talking to me? Or are you ask are you are, to, are we are you engaging here with uh with Jesus's question here? Bill says, is that three hundred dollars after a mortgage? Right. All good questions, right? Right. You're you're thinking in the right direction, right? B Whammy says I'm looking into using business credit card balance transfer for a down payment on a buy and hold, have tenants pay it back. Any thoughts? Yeah, I love that strategy. We have on our website, if you go to our website and go to our funding option, we have a great option for that um, on our website. Daniel, yes, exactly. Okay, so what is your basis to calculate ROI? Okay, so a lot of good questions here, right? So $300, oh, it is $300 in your pocket. Okay, so that's after expenses, after, well, I mean, it depends on if you're happy with that, right? One of my rental properties, uh, I think the cheapest or the, the least amount one of my rental properties produced for me, it was a, f a house I owned free and clear, and it produced like $515 a month. You know, think about that. For so it, it all depends on what your freedom number is. Right, Jesus? Have you downloaded our freedom cheat sheet? So just go to our website, morrisinvest.com slash freedom. We'll put a link right here in the chat for you. morrisinvest.com slash freedom. And figure out what your freedom number is. Because that $300 goes towards that freedom number. And what is a freedom number? It's simply adding up your amount of expenses that you have, figuring out how much cash flow you need in order to have all of that covered so you can live financially free, right? So if every month it costs for you and your family to live to pay for Netflix and groceries and gas and all of the stuff that goes into funding your life, Jesus, then is it $2,000 a month? Well, great. Then that three hundred dollars goes towards your two thousand, right? Now imagine having a number of those three hundred dollar properties. Then you got six hundred. Then you got nine hundred. Then you've got twelve hundred. And then you know, so then you might need just a handful of those three hundred dollar producing properties, and you're financially free. So, to me, three hundred dollars in cash flow that is right in your pocket is great. But again, what is that return on investment? Is it free and clear? Is your mortgage? So all of those things need to go into it. I personally want with like the properties that we do, I want to have an internal rate of return of about 18% and higher than that. Um, so are you just barely making it? Is it a 2% return, 3% return after expenses? So a lot here to, to, to consider, but please download the Freedom Cheat Sheet. I think go through that. That'll kind of help you figure out whether or not $300 is good or not. Exactly. Bill says, now imagine having five more of those properties doing the same thing. 300, 300, 300. But a lot of the properties that we do at Morris Invest are going to be $1,000, $1,200, $2,000. You know, depends on the cash flow of the property, single family, duplex, so a lot more. But it's all relative, right? It could be $10,000. It doesn't matter. It's all relative. It all just, just depends on what your freedom number is and does it fit into that puzzle? And is it a good you know, return on investment? All right, I guess we should get started here. We're going to talk about, let me just pull my, all righty, right, all right, all right, okay. Uh, Shell Grand says, hey, looking to buy, but the rising interest rates and recession make me putting everything on pause. Okay, well, today's show is all for you. Today's show is right, right for you guys. All right. <clears throat> all right, so that's what we're going to talk about is interest rates. 
So welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome into the Real Estate Investing Show. I'm Clayton Morris, longtime real estate investor. I'm the founder of the full service rental real estate company called Morris Invest. And one of the things we focus on is building brand new construction properties with our team that cash flow from virtually from day one. And what we really love to focus on is like keeping more of your own money in your pocket. So we're, we are relying on the banks. We are relying on over 100 different lenders that we work with. I don't want to use my own money. I want to use other people's money, specifically the bank's money. Why should Wall Street get all the fun, right? So we should be able to just make a down payment and be able to cash flow that property above all of our expenses, above our mortgage payment, and have the bank carry the rest of it. All the while, we're building up equity because a tenant is paying the rent on that property, in addition to which we're getting the tax benefits of owning that property. That's the beauty. There's no other asset like this where... You can buy an asset, okay? You get the asset by just putting down a down payment, a 25% down payment or so, right? And then a bank funds the rest of it, but then you get 100% of the tax benefits of that item, <laughs> of that asset. There's nothing else like it. Not in gold, not in silver, nothing. Not raw land, nothing. It only comes down to real estate. But now there's a lot of questions around these interest rates, right? It's no secret that interest rates are on the rise. And today we're going to dive deep into what this means for investors, including what you should do right now and what to do consider, consider moving forward. Now, last week we had a private mentoring session in our Financial Freedom Academy. It's our Financial Freedom Academy um, at financialfreedomacademy.com. And we had a special mentoring session um, that we do just for just for Financial Freedom Academy members. And during the live mentoring session, one of our members, Brian, asked a inter very interesting question about rising interest rates. He asked, with housing prices rising, a lot of people have equity available, like some people who are watching right now in our, in our show. Um, but since the interest rates are also rising, does it make sense to tap into that equity? Now, he used the example of having a mortgage at a 3.5% interest rate, but getting a HELOC or a cash out refinance at 5.75%. Okay, great question. I thought it was a, a brilliant question. It really kind of cut to the heart of the matter. And I think it sparked a really thought provoking conversation around interest rates and the economy and what to do here. So it's timely right now with how these interest rates are potentially spiking in the near future. So I wanted to address it with you all today here on this show. Now, before we dive into this topic, let me make, you know, take this opportunity to invite you to join our Financial Freedom Academy. You can go to financialfreedomacademy.com. It's our wealth building course. And although, no, it's not a real estate investing course specifically, it's a great tool if you're a real estate investor because it teaches you about building wealth through assets. Enrollment comes with access to our exclusive Facebook group. And every month we have our private Zoom sessions where you're able to ask live questions of Natalie and I in the Financial Freedom Academy. So it's a great resource. We have great conversations there. Again, it's financialfreedomacademy.com. Okay, plug over. Now, let's get into the topic of rising interest rates in 2022. Here's the thing. If you took advantage of the historically low interest rates over the past few years, way to go. Congratulations for you. But if you didn't, there's no need to beat yourself up over it because hindsight is 2020, right? But you are watching this show right now. So while you can't go back in time, you can actually take advantage of those things right now and what's available right now given the current interest rates. So again, you can't go backwards. You're not getting 2.75% interest rates right now, but you still can take advantage of historically relatively low interest rates. I mean, think about the early 1980s, okay, when we had 18 and 19% 19 interest rates. What's amazing to think of is that there were realtors working at that time. I mean, my dad worked for Century 21 in the early 1980s. I mean, putting on that brown coat. Can you imagine trying to sell homes with interest rates in 18, 19%, but people were buying them because they needed to, and that's just what the interest rates looked like. But getting in the game now rather than waiting is a smart move because even though interest rates are higher than they were a few months ago, paying 5% interest is better than doing nothing and making 0% in returns. So think about that. And again, I come back to something that my friend Robert Shimon talked about. He's the author of, hey, the, he's the author of The Landlord's Guide to, I, I forget, he's got a lot of books. He's a New York Times bestseller. And uh, he's 
I love his analogy, and he's just a straightforward kind of guy. But one of the things he said to me was, look, you know, if someone's going to give me, as long as I'm netting, like, let's say, like, let's say I'm netting 9% return, netting, or uh, let's say I'm netting 5% after my taxes and after my expenses, I'm netting 5%. Great. He said, if someone's willing to lend me money at 4%, I'll take it. Oh, I get that 1% because I'm building equity and I'm building assets. And I love that idea. Like he didn't need to have a 10, 15, 20 point spread. He's still building assets, building cash flow, getting the tax advantages of that on the backs of somebody else's money. So put that in perspective for a moment. Now we're not talking about that constricted of an economy right now or that constricted uh, of interest rates with deals right now, but just have that as a frame of reference. And he's a multi-million, multi-millionaire real estate investor, New York Times best-selling author. So when it really matters what we're talking about numbers here, like I want you to think about what is your return look like? What is your internal rate of return? Yes, your interest rate is important to some extent, but as long as your asset is outperforming that interest rate, then you're coming out on top. You can still make a net profit right now. And I think it's very realistic to make a nice net profit. So Let's use Brian's example here, okay? When Brian asked this question in our live mentoring group, he, he had a mortgage rate of 3.5% interest, but tapping into some of that equity at 5.75%. Now, is it painful for him to spring for a higher interest rate? Sure, I get that. That's right. the question, right? It seems like, oh my God, I got this equity and I have this property and I'm paying, I paid 0.75% for it. I have equity, but now the only way I'm going to be able to tap out that equity is at a higher interest rate. I get it. I get it. But does it make sense to tap into that equity? And the answer, in my opinion, is yes. The reason I think that is because if you can get a return that's higher than your interest rate, it's still a smart move. Again, it's all numbers. It's not, don't get emotional about it. We can't go back to 2021 and interest rates just yet. But we can still make use other people's money to build wealth, right? So for example, our properties have our properties at Morris Invest, what we do at our company, Morris Invest, have a minimum internal rate of return of 18%. Okay. Now, in this example, you're making 18% on your investment, but you're paying 5.75% to the bank. Now, Making a great investment comes down to a lot more than just that interest rate, of course, putting that aside for a moment, specifically talking about real estate within our programs. Here are some other things I want you to consider along with that internal rate of return. Number one, low vacancy rates in our markets. So great that you've got your interest rates lined up, but what happens if the house is vacant? Then you're not producing anything. And so one of the reasons why interest rates is only a small portion of this formula is because vacancy rates are also incredibly important and we only build our properties in areas with low vacancy rates. So we want to make sure that if that property goes vacant because a tenant moves, that we have somebody else lined up within like a week or two or or even before that because for our properties we have a waiting list. So the idea is that, okay, we're going to get in there, touch up paint, maybe new carpet, et cetera, whatever it is in the tenant turnover process, and a new tenant should be able to move right in. I don't want that property sitting vacant for three months. No way. So what are the vacancy rates in your markets? These are other things to consider. We're able to build in amazing markets. So again, we're able to build in areas that are highly in demand, properties that are income producing. We want to be cash flow positive. And not to mention that when the loan is eventually paid down, the return increases. So, okay, I get you're at 5.75% for now. Ride that. But as that tenant is paying down those the overall um, balance, you're building up your equity position. You're building up your net worth. So anyway, here's my big takeaway in response to Brian. Looking forward, we can know that we can expect interest rates to climb and continue to climb this year. Next year, we could see interest rates around 7%. Think about that. Next year, 7% interest rates. And you'd be kicking yourself for not taking advantage of today's rates. We don't know what the next 10, 5, 10, 15 years is going to hold for us, right? Perhaps we'll see low rates again. I hope we do. 
and I'm sure we probably will. In that case, you can always refinance into a lower rate product at some point, right? So you're not locked into this forever. If in five, three, four, five years, the interest rate goes from 575 back down to a 2.75 on a 15 year, what it fixed, great. Then refinance into that in a few years. You're not locked into that. But for now, you'd be kicking yourself. Because what else are you going to do to hedge against this inflation right now? You, you want to deal with the volatility of the stock market? Do you want to deal with the volatility of crypto? Again, fine to play on the side with those things. But as a wealth preservation tool, no way. No way. My advice would be to take advantage of what's available right now, especially since we know that rates are going up. Heck, Jerome Powell last week told us that, right? I mean, Jerome Powell last week said likely to see a, you know at least a seven, seven rate increases this year. They're coming. So you can sit on your hands and keep thinking, ah, I can't do it. I saw someone in the chat saying, hey, I'm, you know, I'm sitting on my hands now. I'm not going to do this right now because I think there's a recession coming and uh, interest rates are going up. Well, and then what? Then you have no cash flow and no assets and no cash flowing assets. I mean, we have a housing crisis in the United States. We need houses. People need a place to live. You know, we have one of the lowest job, we have one of the lowest unemployment rates in U.S. history right now. So we don't have a job crisis. What we have right now is uh, we have an inflation problem. So you're going to you're going to sit on the sidelines and not have assets that are a hedge against inflation. Again, real estate is the number one hedge against inflation. Number one. So if your money is sitting in cash, you're sitting on the sidelines and it's sitting in a savings account somewhere. That money is not you're, it's losing value every day because the, the value of U.S. dollar is continuing to drop. But having a, a cash flowing real estate asset that not only appreciates, adds to your net worth, but is a cash, you know, it's a tax vehicle, it's a tax haven, right? And is producing cash flow. It's a no brainer. So another important thing to consider in all of this is that as rates rise, we know that they are, we know that that's going to happen, right? They've already told us. Remember that you have other options aside from conventional loans. So if your credit is in trouble, I saw someone asking this question earlier in the show. Someone saying, you know, her credit is in trouble. She's got a lot of rental properties, but because of a divorce, she's got bad credit. She has this issue. Okay, it doesn't matter. Because at Morris Invest, what we do, we offer multiple other programs, including non-recourse loans inside of a self-directed IRA, which is mind-blowing. Think about that. Non-recourse, which is not tied to you personally, inside of a self-directed IRA. So it grows tax-free. All of these things, I mean, are just mind-blowing once you start to educate yourself about it. But don't sit there and bury your head in the sand. The Fed has, tell, has told us what's coming. They've told us interest rates are rising. We know that the value of U.S. dollar is dropping. We also know that we could see continued supply chain problems. We, we, we talked about this uh, earlier today, but we're looking at supply chain 2.0 problems right now. We see that, you know, obviously China is clamping down once again. Shanghai is going back under lockdown. We could see more chip shortages, you name it bigger supply chain problems, food shortages. I mean, President Biden last week said, we know that food shortages are coming. <laughs> so this is what we're dealing with in the United States. So prepare your, they're telling us, they're telling us right now what's happening. Don't bury your head in the sand and don't be sitting on cash, which is declining every day. Look, I know we covered a lot of ground today, so let me sum up a few main points for you before we um, open it up for some questions today on the show. Number one, Although interest rates are higher than they've been in a number of years, they're also lower than they will be than they than they will be going forward. So we know that they're going to be going up shortly. So take advantage of these rates now. Don't continue to bury your head in the sand because you can always refinance in the future if things unexpectedly change for the better. Again, as long as the internal rate of return and your net cash flow is is good and solid and you're actually making more in cash flow and you're netting than what you're paying out to a bank, that's a win-win. You've got an asset, you've got a tax haven, and you've got cash flow. 
And plus, you have a hedge against inflation. Things to think about. Number two, it's okay to pay a little bit more for interest as long as the return on your asset is greater. Okay, remember, it's just a numbers game. And number three, something else we talked about today, have a backup plan. I mean, think of some other ways that you can grow your portfolio without relying on the Fed and the big banks and Wall Street. Okay, not having all of your money tied to a 401k or, uh, you, you know, in government bonds. We saw the volatility in the bond market. Be very, very careful about these things. You know, how can you invest outside of this, this corrupt government and banking system? And how can you build assets that are tangible, real things that, are, that aren't going away and are being taken from you? So all of that to say, you know, go out there, take action, become a real estate investor. I believe it still is the number one way to build wealth, even with some slightly higher interest rates for now. All right, let's open it up for some Q&A here. Uh, let's see. Nightmare Cock says, I thought physical gold is the number one hedge against inflation. Uh, no. I don't know who told you that. Uh, physical gold, owning physical gold, but first of all, if you can find it, and then where do you store it? But owning physical gold, yes, is great, but it's not a hedge against inflation. I mean, it, it's a hedge. It it's a hedge against inflation, but it's not as much of a hedge against inflation as real estate because you you get the um, you get all sorts of additional benefits from a tax perspective that you don't get. By owning gold. So yes, gold and silver, precious metals, and real estate. I mean, these three things, I would just say those two things, precious metals and real estate. That's it. For thousands of years have been a hedge against inflation. For thousands of years have existed and sustained. Actually, I could add a third thing in there. Art. <laughs> okay. Yes. Works of art. Um, high, high end works of art. In times of great stress throughout history, art, artwork, Picassos and Renoirs, 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 Renoir, uh, have been a hedge against, well, not a hedge against inflation. They've been a preservation of wealth, right? Like rich families had our expensive art in a, you know, would pack up their art when their, when their village was being burned and they'd flee, right? They still had that art. So yes, if you're into that, great. But real estate, precious metals and art. But with real estate, you get the added level of cash flow, okay? You don't get that with precious metals. And on top of that, you get the tax benefits of real estate. You don't get that with precious metals. So for me, uh, that's the top of the heap, absolutely. Uh, let's see. Shell Grant says, address the fact that housing prices are likely to drop with rising interest rates. Um. Again, what does that matter? So I kind of come back to this point. I don't really care at all about like the homes that I own in my portfolio. Or if you ask any high level real estate investor, do they care month to month the value of their homes? The answer will be no. Time again. I mean, again, this is one question sitting with Robert Kiyosaki at lunch. I asked him, I said, do you even know, Robert, what author of Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I said, Robert, do you even know, like the, and he owns like 2,000 properties. I said, do you know um, the value of your homes? He said, no, and I don't care, which is the right answer. So maybe they'll go up a little bit, great. Maybe they'll go down a little bit, great. Maybe they'll come back. It doesn't matter because the cash flow is there. If you're a cash flow investor and you're using them as a tax haven, you don't care that it goes up 10,000, down 10,000, up 10, it doesn't really matter. I don't care. I really don't. I, I, I don't know any of the values of my properties unless I'm analyzing them. What you want to do, look at your portfolio, you know, once a year or every few months to get a sense of, you know, where you are in the market, mostly once a year to get a sense. And then maybe some of your properties have appreciated so nicely that you decide to sell because the, the cash flow uh, formula doesn't really make sense anymore, Shell. So for instance, um, Shell says, of course you don't care what the prices are. It seems like you're really contrarian, Shell. Like I, I love, 
or you really don't want to become an investor. Like you're like, I really am looking for any excuse I can. Of course you don't care what the prices are because you already bought prior to the drop. I buy prices, I buy properties in a drop. I don't, I don't wait for a dip. Like, yes, you can find some deals, Shell. If you're going to go out there and try to find some, good luck, good luck. But go to try to find like the first two properties I ever bought. Foreclosure and a short sale years ago. I had to do all the work myself. I had to hire a whole team myself to do it. It was a huge pain in the ass. Okay, great. I found a deal. Now what? Now I've got to hire contractors, which good luck finding contractors right now. You're, you're not going to find them. Um, or if you do, you're going to be on a massive wait list. Good luck buying materials, which are also difficult to come by. And because of supply chain shortages, huge problems. So, uh, you know, you can talk yourself out of anything. Right? Hey, we're all going to go to the movies tomorrow. <sighs> Yeah, but you know what? I don't know. I, I, you know, I just don't feel like I'm in the mood for popcorn. So, but, but dad, you're not going to come to the movies because the popcorn's there? Well, because I'll smell it and then I'll be hungry for it. And I, you know, I might want that popcorn and I, it, it, dad, are you crazy? So you, we can always find any possible way to talk ourselves out of it. I buy properties in dips. I buy properties in good markets. It doesn't matter. Again, is the internal rate of return there, Shell? I hope that makes sense. Like, you don't have to, uh, you, you know, you see what I'm saying, Shell? Like, I'm just, I'm just spitballing here with you. But you don't, it doesn't matter. It just comes down to the numbers. You see what I'm saying? It just comes down to the numbers. So, Shell, I just challenge you to say, like, hey, if it's a good market, great. As long as the internal rate of return is still producing, like, an, like, like I'm talking about, like an 18% return, what does it matter? What does it matter if it's a dip or if it's a boom in market? It doesn't matter. It, it really doesn't. I hope, uh, does that make sense? I, I, I don't, um, okay, good. Shell, we're all on the same page here. I just, um, there's, there, when you watch like CNBC, for instance, and I'm not saying you do, but I'm just saying what, when you see news anchors and reporters from like CNBC and they're on there and they're talking about, Oh, trouble in the housing market, trouble in the housing market. What they're talking about is retail retail buyers, people who are going to buy a house to live in themselves. Like when Dana Olnick, she's a good reporter for CNBC, she covers the housing beat for CNBC. But she specifically only covers the retail beat. Like... Ask her to like do a story that has nothing to do with homeowners moving into house. And she, they don't understand what we do here. <laughs> they don't understand what we do here. They don't. They simply don't. It's a whole different animal. So, you know, if you're a millennial and you're like, oh, me and my wife are considering buying our first home because we have a child on the way. Well, maybe we'll hold out because interest rates are going up and we can't afford it right now. Right. That, that's what CNBC focuses on. That millennial home buyer who at 4% interest could have bought that home because their job paid a certain amount and now they won't be able to cover their mortgage if it goes to 5%. So they're going to hold off from buying a home. And now that what will happen is some of those retail home prices will start to drop a little bit and the retail home buyer market will slow down a little bit. They're not talking about what we do here as real estate investors. Okay, We are buying properties that have an internal rate of return of at least 18% or higher. Net internal rate of return. That means that mortgage is covered, the cash flow, and we're getting the tax benefits. And so whenever I watch these like CNBC reporters, I'm just like, they just don't under, they don't ever, ever, ever cover stories about what we do here. They never do. Occasionally, they'll cover, um, there was one Wall Street Journal article a few months ago that they, I couldn't believe they actually did it. It was a front page Wall Street Journal article. And maybe Kelly, maybe you could drop that link in here and I'll put it up on the screen. Um, but it specifically talked about how investors, and I couldn't believe it. I was seeing it. Mainstream media was covering what we do here. Investors are seeing huge returns buying single family homes and duplexes as investment property, like as a hedge against inflation in this economy. And I was like, whoa, they're actually covering it? 
and they were, and they went through and they pointed out why the benefit of owning single family homes that cash flow uh, for a lot of investors was was crushing the was crushing Wall Street returns. Maybe we, if you have that link, Kelly, drop it in here, and I'll try to I'll try to put it up here on the screen. Uh, but I just want you to understand. When you're sitting at home and you're flipping around, you see Lester Holt from NBC News come on at 6.30 before Wheel of Fortune. He's like, the housing market in America is slowing down. You know, blah, blah, blah. They're not talking about us. Everyone watching the show right now, they're not talking about investors. They're talking about a millennial home buyer that is now like works a nine to five job that suddenly they thought they could buy that house with their new child on the way. They can't now because the interest rates went from 4 to 6%. Totally different story than what we do right here. Ah, thank you. Thank you, Kelly. I think that was Kelly that dropped it in here. I'm going to pull this article up here on the screen and show you what I'm talking about here. Okay. Uh, sorry. Yes. I, I love this article because it was such a rare bird. <laughs> It was like, really? Wall Street Journal's covering what we do here? Uh, they just don't, they just ignore. So here is this Wall Street Journal article. Building and renting single family homes is top performing investment. And I kind of laughed because they're getting an 8% return on in this story. And like what we do at my company, not to toot our own horn, but is a minimum 18%. So, you know, just tack a 10 onto that. Anyway. Average risk adjusted annual return for build to rent investments is now 8%. So that's what we're talking about. Okay, that's what I'm talking about. And this article is only a few months old. So that hopefully that uh, gives you a little. Um... Stan, where are you located? Um, our offices are, well, we have our office in Arizona um, and our team in Texas. Um, if you and Stan says, let me pull this up here. Sorry. Whoop. Let me see. We got a lot of great questions. I'm going to try to get through them here if I can. So, uh, Shell, I, I, uh, I didn't mean to get a little inflammatory, uh, but I hope, but I hope that makes sense. Okay, Stan, let's see here. Okay, Stan, where are you? Oh, yeah. If you were to buy a rental property, do I purchase it in my name or create an LLC? If I, so, you're asking me. I'm not a financial advisor. If I were to buy a rental property, you, I always buy them in an LLC. Always, always, always. From a liability perspective, I never, ever, ever want to own a property in my own name. Period. It's not about taxes. It's yes, you're op setting up an LLC that owns the rental property. God forbid a tenant slips and falls, hurts his or herself. You know, you have insurance that, but let's say something happened, God forbid, it's all about liability protection because then they can only sue the LLC. Okay. And the LLC only owns the property, right? They don't have access to your personal assets as a result of it. So absolutely. And our team does that. Our team can help you with that. If you book a call with our team um, at Morris Invest, that's what we do. Uh, and yes, we build, we're building about 500, uh, we're on pace for about 500 properties we're building this year for our clients. Um, uh, so all you need to do, if you want to book a call with our team, just come over to our website, just go to morrisinvest.com, click on the book a call button. It's totally free. Just click on that button, put in your, put in your, uh, a calendar will pop up. So you pick the 30 minute time slot. Uh, it's totally free. We'll jump on the phone with you and kind of just you know, map out like what your goals are, um, and figure out your financial freedom strategy. Um, so like these are the properties we build mostly we are focused in West Texas to Stan's question. Um, mostly in Lubbock and Odessa and Midland, uh, other markets coming soon, but this is what we mostly focus on. Um, we build in the best school districts, single families and duplexes, ground up construction, um, and then uh, cash flowing from virtually day one. So by the time you're closing on the property with financing, we have a, oh, we work with over a hundred different lenders. Um, by the time you're closing on the property, uh, the tenant should either be moving in or just moved in or about to move in so that you're cash flowing virtually from day one. 
That's the goal. And sometimes there's an overlap. So like a, you know, a few weeks or so, but, um, virtually from day one. And we have a waiting list for tenants to move into the properties. Um, so anyway, if you want to book a, te- a call with our team, it's totally free. We can help you get all that set up. So just go to morrisinvest.com. Plus, we have all kinds of great blog resources here as well. Check out all of the resources. The team does such a great job. And we have, um, you know, what are the all sorts of property breakdowns like how, and, and, and formulas and math and all, <laughs> you know, all of that. Uh, how much profit should you make on a rental property? Um, all of those things um, we walk through here on the on the website. It's all here. All these great resources. Uh, oh, we actually added a new section called our um, uh, our. Oh, it does. It's hidden behind this, but it's our resources page. Um, so come over and check out our resources page as well. We've got a lot of stuff there to help you as well. Um, spreadsheets, downloadable stuff. It's all all free. All right, let's see. Uh, Jesus has a question about purchasing in, uh, okay, new construction in Texas. Sorry to change the subject. I'm purchasing a new construction in Texas using a HELOC. I plan to use the cash flow to pay it back, but also I will pay an additional $300 to it every two weeks. Okay. Is that a question? Sorry, I'm purchasing new construction in Texas and using a home equity line of credit. Great. I plan to use the cash flow to pay it back but also I will pay an additional $300 to the HELOC every two weeks. That's awesome. I love that strategy. I mean, heck, I've, I've written a whole book on that strategy called How to Pay Off Your Mortgage in Five Years. So look, there are three stages of real estate investing, right? Buy, own, and cash flow. Depending on where you are in your life, what age you are, when you're starting out and you've got a job and you've got money coming in, you pretend like, just pretend like that cash flow doesn't even exist. Okay, so maybe you have five rental properties where that cash flow is coming in. Personally, I I want to treat that as if I don't even have it. You know, the thing that people make a mistake in the United States specifically is they get a raise and they start acting like the raise. They start spending more money. They start going, you know, what if you just pretended like you never got a raise? Like whenever I got a raise at my job in I used to work in Fox News. I was a television anchor for many, many years. Whenever I got a raise or my contract renewal, I pretended like I didn't get it. And I would use that cash, that additional cash to buy rental properties. I just pretended like I didn't even get that monthly cash, you know, so I would put it towards different investments. I would pay down debt, pay down mortgages. So yes, using that additional uh, funds to fire it at your balance. Great. You're in the buy phase. Then you get to a point when you're in the owning phase. Great. And then the cash flow. Everything's paid off and it's all sugar. It's all It's all cake. It's all ice. I don't know. It's all something. It's all something sweet. Icing on the cake? I don't know. Daniel. See, Veronica says, I'm selling my property that produces $39,000 per year in rental income. I'm asking $280 for it. Oh, in Florida. That's right. Good for you. Um, Daniel says, what state do you register your LLC? Well, good question. Personally, we're, so we have a holding company LLC in the state of Wyoming. Okay. And each of the individual LLCs report up to the Wyoming holding company. Wyoming, because it's great for business, protects you against all sorts of things. Wyoming uh, does not deal kindly with BS. So you really can protect yourself by having um, a Wyoming LLC. Now, in the states where I own properties, each of those states has an LLC. So my Texas properties, I have an LLC in Texas that owns the Texas properties. Now, up to a certain value amount too. So our, our, our tax accountant, Tom Wheelwright, likes to say, you know, your mileage may vary depending on your threshold for, for, for risk. But, you know, you might find that you might need two Texas LLCs or three, depending on how many properties you add to it. Remember, your exposure is you're exposed based on the value of that LLC. So again, <sighs> I hate to say this. I mean, I've never had this happen, but it does happen where like a tenant might slip and fall or there's some issue or something or the city decides to sue you because you didn't fix the sidewalk or who knows, right? Well, the city then can only sue the LLC. 
or the tenant could only sue the LLC, okay? And then you have insurance that would cover it. But if beyond that, there was some issue, they can only come after what that LLC owns. They can't come after you, John, and your personal house where you live with your family and your kids, okay? It's the beauty of having limited liability corporations. So again, where your properties are located, that's where I have LLCs set up in those particular town, in those particular states. So Florida, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Indiana, Texas, Ohio, where else? Oh, I own uh, in North Carolina. So wherever I own my properties, um, I have LLCs in those states. Yes, it requires extra accounting. <laughs> That's why you want to have a CPA and a bookkeeper and an accountant and all of that. But you're in a business. You're running a business, right? These are things you were not taught in school. Do, do, do. Let's see here. Any other questions? Is there a possibility I can get in this game? Uh, yes, there absolutely is. Get in the game now. You're watching here. This is, this is where you start, my friend, Nicholas. Start watching the videos here on the channel. You're in the game. The fact that you're taking time out of your day right now to watch and be here live with us, you're in the game, okay? You are doing what 99.9% .9 of people will never do. They're too lazy, honestly. They'd rather work for a 401k, work for somebody else, okay? And they'd rather... Um, um, uh, uh, They'd rather work for somebody else, work for a 401k, and never really build wealth because they're too lazy. That's just the bottom line. You know, if, if it were that easy, everyone would do it. Um, and uh, there's no, you know, there's no such thing. So you've got it. The only way we grow is through discomfort. So you're here. Start watching the videos. Um, we have so everything you need to learn is free. It's right here on our channel. It's all right here. Everything that I've learned, and I'm not that smart, everything that I've learned and done and made mistakes and gone through and built wealth, it's right here on this channel. It's all free. So just start watching the videos. Naza Sanchez says, yes, watch and read. Yes, Clayton, lazy. You hit the nail right on the head. Exactly. Look, how many, um, I love this little formula. I, I'm sorry, I've had some coffee and I'm, I'm just pumped up because I'm, I'm, I'm in a good mood here. Um, because you guys are asking good questions and I, I love engaging when, when I get good questions and people want to learn and you want to build wealth and you're not, you're, you guys are not lazy. Here's a little formula I like to do. Um, what is uh, 24 times 12? Okay. Hold on, why did I ask that question? Sorry, I'm just thinking differently here. All right, I'm going to do a little formula here. I love this little math equation here. Uh, let's see here. Sorry, pull up my calculator here. So, uh, seven, two, two, two. All right. So, so let's think about this for a minute. How many hours there are? People say that they don't have time, right? I can't stand that. Oh, there's just no time. I don't have time. I have, I'm too busy. I have to. Oh yeah. How much? How much Netflix are you watching? You know. I, really, you don't have time? So let's just break this down. Think about it. There's 168 hours in a week, right? 24 hours in a day, seven days a week. That's 168 hours, okay? So now let's take out, You work. let's say you work 40 hours a week, okay? Maybe We could even say 45, but let's just say 40 hours a week, okay? So 168 minus 40 hours. That's 128 hours left. Okay, so 128 hours left. What about sleeping, Clayton? Okay, so let's take out eight hours a day. Okay, um, so eight hours. That's 56. So now you're getting eight hours of sleep. How many here are people watching right now actually get eight hours of sleep a night? You're not. Americans do not. No way. No way. But let's say you did sleep eight hours a night. That's 56 hours. Okay, so we had 168 hours minus 40 hours. That's 128, right? 128 hours minus 56 hours of sleep. Okay, 128 hours minus 56 hours of sleep. And we already minused out 40 hours for working. Okay, so not only we took out 40 hours for working, and we took out 
56 hours of eight hours sleep a night. That leaves us with 72 hours in a week. You just like think about that for a second, right? Okay, but all right, what about dinner time with the family? Okay, let's take out one hour of dinner time with the family seven days a week. Okay, so minus seven. Okay, how many more excuses can we come up with? Right, there's 60, sorry. There's 65 hours left. 65 hours. Right? 65 hours. And you think about when people say, hey, man, that guy has his 10,000 hours. Right? When, like that, a person that has 10,000 hours, as in Malcolm Gladwell writes about in his book in, in Outliers, right? Um, I think it's Outliers. When he talks about people that reach an expert status at 10,000 hours. So imagine like, okay, 65 hours a week that we have available extra beyond sleep, having dinner with the family, and going to work. That's a lot of extra time to build wealth and to learn a new skill, learn, learn a new trade on the side. It's separate from work. You know, get home at five o'clock, have dinner at six with the family. Great. Chat a little bit with the spouse, sit down by the fire, get out that book. Take out that iPad, uh, that, uh, that iPad to start doing that, that online training, you know, start learning. We always hear the stories about the single mom, right, who puts, puts the daughter to bed and then goes downstairs and learns how to become a nurse or something, right? You can do it. Anyone can do it. So, Nicholas, I'm kind of coming back to your question here when you say, can I get in the game? Yes. You know, and if you don't have money, that's only one piece of real estate investing. You know, if you don't have money, then find the deals. Find the people. And bring the deals to the people with the money. That's how you create. I mean, again, most of the real estate investors I know who become multimillionaires had no money when they started. You know, again, Robert Kiyosaki bought his first rental property in Hawaii using a credit card. So you can do it and you have the time. Cut out the Netflix time. Cut out the extra wasted time that you're, you know, sitting there doing nothing. And if, if, and, and if you really want to accomplish something, then map it out and block it out in your calendar and say, you know, from 7 to 9 p.m., please don't bother me. I'm going to learn how to play guitar. <laughs> you know, I'm going to learn a new language. I'm going to learn how to build wealth. You have the time. You have the time. Naza says, yeah, Netflix or read books, your choice. Yeah. And, all, you know, you think about it, like we all need downtime. But there's 65 hours of downtime that you have available. Find find 20 minutes to do a meditation find you know an hour at night to wind down before bed and read a read read something fun read a novel you know do you need 65 hours worth of netflix do you need to catch up on every episode of friends no mike yeah mike wants to know here our average down payment is about 45,000 to invest you should have a buffer as well for your own protection our team would discuss that with all uh, with you so mike yeah that's that's a right around there about 45,000 uh joseph i'd have to i'd have to know the ins and outs of your um your particular properties with the bank um who are you working with our team Joseph, um, if you are, then I would just get on the phone with them. That's why they're there. They'll help you with this. And I'll, uh, Olivier says, the time we're taking to watch this is learning. Exactly. So hopefully this is not wasted time because this is financial intelligence. You know, this is building up financial uh, your financial intelligence here. And remember also that... The tax code benefits real estate professionals, okay? That doesn't mean you have to be a real estate agent, but that means that if you devote 750 hours a year to real estate investing or to real estate, you become a real estate professional in the eyes of the IRS, which puts you in a whole other tax bracket. I mean, a huge savings in taxes. Now, you cannot also work a full-time job, nine to five, because they're going to prioritize that on the taxes so if you do it on the side, it still doesn't count. However, you can start moving in that direction. And if you've got a spouse, let's say you're a doctor or you're a dentist or whatever, and your spouse is at home, doesn't work, 
that spouse can start to spend that time educating his or herself and register and become a real estate professional. Now, because you're married and filing jointly, that affects you too. So even though you are a doctor or a lawyer or a, a dentist and you're not leaving your day job anytime soon because your spouse is spending the time 750 hours a year studying and working in real estate, now it protects you as well under the tax code. So now you, we've talked, it's amazing. We've had doctors that we work with at Morris Invest. We've had, we've had uh, dentists that when our team tells them that, they literally start crying. And we've had, we've had doctors who start crying on the phone because Uncle Sam is taking hundreds of thousands of dollars in taxes from them. They work long hours at the hospital, but their spouse is at home and does not work and now can become a real estate professional and completely save that doctor hundreds of thousands of dollars in taxes. Like that's financial education, okay? They don't teach you that in school. Schools will never teach you this stuff. So thank you for taking the time out of your day uh, to be here with us on this live stream. Remember, go through our um, full website at morrisinvest.com. And if you want to book a call with our team, we're happy to jump on the phone with you and help you out. Again, please put in the correct email address. <laughs> I can't, I don't know what it is. That and the phone number. I do it all the time too. You know, you type your phone. You, how often do you type out a phone number? But please, when you book a call with us um, on our website, a calendar will pop up. Just click on the free book a free call button here at morrisinvest.com. And uh, please put in your correct, pick the time that you want. You know, what time of day, what, what, what time of the, what, what day of the week. And then also please uh, choose the, uh, put in your, type in your email correctly and your phone number correctly. So that way we can call you. So that you don't, oh, so you don't send us a nasty email later and say, I booked a call, but no one ever called me. And then that's because the phone number was wrong. It happens like 20 times a week. So please, please, please just type your phone number correctly and we'll be happy to jump on the phone with you. Um, thank you guys so much. I really appreciate you joining us today. And uh, we will be back here next Tuesday at uh, noon Eastern time. So any questions you have, please fire them away next week. I'll try to answer as many questions as I can. Much